Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Tam uh, from Stockholm Karolinska Institute and uh, first of all I would just like to thank the organizers for letting me speak for you today. Uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, my talk is called Insomnia, Depression and Inflammation in Patients with Allergy and the General Population. And throughout this talk I will show you some data collected here at the Karolinska Institute uh, a couple of years ago, as well as some data that I've been working with during my recent postdoc stay in, in Oxford at the University of Oxford. And I'll start with just giving you some background to this talk and uh, a few things might be yeah, very well known uh, to you, I guess. So we know that pro-inflammatory cytokines are involved in the regulation of sleep. Uh, we also know that insomnia, as well as short and long sleep duration, have been associated with increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and also increased levels of C-reactive protein. And there has been a, a suggested link between pro-inflammatory cytokines and uh, deep sleep or N3, uh, stage N3 sleep specifically. Uh, we also know that depression is associated with increased levels of inflammatory markers at least in a subset of patients. And related to that, we know that insomnia is a very strong predictor of subsequent depression. For depression, uh, it seems to be specifically a typical depression that is more strongly linked to increased levels of C-reactive protein. And this is depression where uh, common symptoms include uh, changes in appetite as well as hypersomnia and lead in paralysis. Um, another aspect is that sleep disturbance, although we think or know it's quite common in inflammatory disorders and uh, their relationship within these disorders to immunological markers uh, remain quite poorly characterized. And uh, the group of patients that I will focus on in the first part of my talk is patients with seasonal allergy. And Allergy is a very common disorder, so the prevalence is estimated to be between 10 to 40 percent for seasonal allergic spinal conjunctivitis. And despite effective symptom specific treatments, uh, we know that patients with, with um, yeah, seasonal allergies suffer from a number of non specific symptoms, such as um, depressive symptoms, fatigue, and disturbed sleep. And uh, the, the overall pathophysiology for allergy involves a systemic inflammation. And we also know that inflammatory cytokines are involved in the regulation of sleep and can also be related to sleep disturbance and fatigue. And specifically for allergy, um, the, the um, inflammatory profile includes a shift toward type 2 helper driven inflammation uh, and increased le plasma levels of IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13 and also an increase in circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1, IL-6 and TNF-alpha. So uh, the first part of this talk will focus on studies in allergic patients that we did here at Karolinska and uh, most of the data are already published and you can find most of them in, in these two papers. And the, the overall aim for this part um, was to characterize the objective and subjective sleep problems in severe seasonal allergy and to investigate the relationship to translocator protein and other inflammatory markers. And um, there are a lot of other kind of related aims and questions that we've been looking at in the same study, but this is the one I will focus on today. And the, the hypothesis of interest for this talk are that uh, we hypothesized that allergic patients will show disturbed subjective and objective sleep compared to controls. And we also um, hypothesized that higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in peripheral blood, as well as the glial marker translocated protein TSPO, as measured with positron emission tomography, will be associated with worse subjective sleep quality, less deep sleep and shorter total sleep time. And the participants that uh, were included in this, this study 
where 18 patients with seasonal allergy and 13 matched controls. Uh, in parallel with, with this study, we run a very similar protocol for patients with rheumatoid arthritis, as well as 19 matched controls. I, I won't show the data specifically for rheumatoid arthritis, but in some cases we uh, used overlapping controls. So in total there were 26 controls, but um, some of them were specifically for the allergic group and some of them were specifically for the rheumatoid arthritis and some were combined. And I also want to mention that we interrupted data collection after interim analysis of the PET data, explaining why we had quite a small sample size. And the oral study design was uh, rather uh, complicated, I guess, because for allergic patients, we wanted to compare them between inside compared to outside pollen season. And the plan was to, uh, well, everyone was supposed to be investigated both uh, within as well as outside pollen season. And the order um, was planned to be uh, balanced. In the end, uh, it wasn't completely balanced, but that was the intention. So, um, all patients as well as controls were, um, were participating twice in the study. And each occasion they started off with uh, measuring sleep as well as daily symptoms of, of um, allergy for uh, well about five to six days. And then we had two days where participants were coming into the lab. And on the first day we did, uh, well, first of all, the the pet, uh, but we also had questionnaires, blood sampling, did body odor collection, overnight urine sampling, uh, 24 hours of electrocardiography. And on the second day we did cognitive assessment as well as uh, pain testing. And um, well, the, the data collection was quite complex with a lot of measures and uh, I won't go into that more deeply today, but just say that the outcomes that are of interest for this talk were sleep measures. Uh, and as I mentioned, we had sleep data on about five, six nights at each occasion. And these included sleep diaries, actigraphy in a subset, and a single electrode EEG uh, measure. We also had positron em uh, emission tomography or PET imaging with the TSBO ligand PBR28, which is sort of a microglia um, ligand, and it's uh, well considered kind of measure of neuroinflammation, even though it's, uh, uh, I mean, it, it has been uh, discussed how good it is as a measure. Uh, we also had blood samples, including pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as uh, disease-specific markers. And uh, yes, uh, some questionnaires as well. Just to show you as uh, overall what the allergic sample looked like, as well as the matched controls. And um, as you see, the numbers don't add up. Yeah, and this is also because of the interrupted data collection. So we had 18 subjects with allergy as well as 13 match controls. And uh, they were, well, um, kind of middle age or the, me the, the median was about 34. Uh, we had, um, well, slightly more males than females. Um, well, relatively normal BMI and they were in general yeah, quite well educated. And these are the the well the results from, from the study. So first of all we could see that patients in with allergy were significantly more fatigued compared to the controls and this was true within as well as uh, outside of pollen season. There was also an interaction so that uh, they were even more fatigued within pollen season compared to com controls. And uh, we saw a similar pattern with rated sleepiness, and this was uh, measured using the Karinska sleepiness scale. So, in general, uh, as part of the sleep diary, so in general, uh, patients with allergy were more sleepy, specifically within pollen season. 
we could also see that patients with allergy had a shorter total sleep time compared to controls, uh, both within as well as without, uh, outside pollen season. And uh, there was an increase in, in percentage of, of uh, deep sleep or slow sleep uh, during pollen season in uh, allergic patients. We also found that uh, there was a sign of peripheral uh, inflammation. So for patients with allergy, we had expected, expected higher levels of IL-5 um, in allergic patients compared to controls. And this difference was even larger outside, uh, sorry, uh, within pollen season. Uh, we could also see an increase in uh, TNF alpha, which is a general pro inflammatory marker uh, within pollen season compared to uh, outside pollen season in allergic patients. However, we did not see any difference between uh, groups or between seasons when it comes to the PET imaging. Then we looked at uh, associations between sleep and markers of inflammation. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we could see that allergic subjects had elevated levels of uh, TNF alpha and IL-5 during pollen season compared to controls. However, when we did a composite measure of pro-inflammatory cytokines, that wasn't uh, related to amount of deep sleep, total sleep time or sleep quality in uh, neither within or uh, across groups. And neither was the marker of uh, microglia, the, this uh, PBR28 TSPO uh, marker, was neither significantly associated to total sleep time, deep sleep or subjective sleep quality. So what we concluded from this study was that there is evidence of fatigue, disturbed sleep and also peripheral inflammation uh, in allergic patients. But uh, this study does not support, support microglia changes as the mechanism behind these symptoms. So in the next part of the talk, I will show some data from, uh, from the UK Biobank. So th this part uh, will focus on cross-section and longitudinal association between sleep health, depression and inflammation in the UK Biobank cohort. So this is more on, on uh, sleep and inflammation and depression in the general population as compared to the, the previous part. And these um, data are data that I've been working on recently, but they are not yet published. So the aim of this study was to investigate inflammation as a possible mediator for the effect of sleep disturbance on development of depressive symptoms in the UK Biobank. And for this study, we pre-registered the, the hypothesis that poor sleep health, um, including insomnia symptoms and long and short sleep duration, is associated with depressive symptoms cross-sectionally and longitudinally. Uh, this is well mainly to, to uh, add to previous uh, studies showing this. And at the baseline visits, the association between poor sleep health and depression is mediated by C-reactive protein levels. Uh, we also hypothesized that CRP levels at baseline would mediate the association between poor sleep health at baseline and depression at follow-up. And uh, I guess most of you aren't that familiar with the UK Biobank, so I will just briefly introduce what that is. So the UK Biobank is a longitudinal cohort study from the UK with adults from the general population that were recruited in the UK between 2006 and 2010. And the target age range for the study was 40 to 69 years and uh, no other exclusion criteria were really applied. And participants were invited through invitation lists, uh, like the post postal invitations, and the response rate was approximately 6%. So even though it's a populational study, it's uh, probably not fully uh, representative. And uh, the study has had three follow-up visits so far. And measures include self-ratings, blood sampling, brain imaging, um, and other things. This is just a graphical overview of the data collection. So it started in 2006 and then there's been three big uh, follow-ups uh, as well as some um, smaller follow-ups, for example, this mental health online follow-up where participants uh, filled in things online. And for the first visit, there was 
uh, about 500,000 individuals, whereas the, the follow-ups have been uh, well, uh, much smaller. And all the measures weren't collected at, at all the follow-ups. So uh, for C-reactive protein levels, that will be one of the most in well, the most important one for this work, were only collected for the baseline visit as well as the first follow-up visit. And the variables of interest that I use in this project were, um, so, so the primary outcome measure was depressive symptoms and the main predictors of interest were insomnia symptoms, sleep duration, as well as C-reactive protein. And uh, we always adjusted the, the analysis for, for uh, correct. So, so in the results, I will show you a crude, adjust, partly adjusted and fully adjusted model. And the partly adjusted model included age, sex, socioeconomic status, as well as education. And in the fully adjusted model, we also had chronotype, sleep medication use, BMI, self-rated health, and number of treatments or medications, as well as specifically psychotropic medication. And the measures in detail, just to explain them. So for insomnia symptoms, we have a question asking, do you have trouble falling asleep at night or do you wake in the middle of the night? And sleep duration is self-reported, uh, categorized as short if shorter than seven hour, hour uh, normal if between seven and nine and long if longer than nine hours. And the depressive symptoms are measured with four questions that are well, in line with PHQ-9 or GED-7, uh, and GED-7. Uh, and the most important one is over the past two weeks, how often have you felt down, depressed or hopeless? There are also questions about feeling tired or having little energy, feeling tense, fidgety or restless, as well as having little interest or pleasure in doing things. And as you can see, uh, although the, the study is huge, um, the downside of that is that, uh, well, in these kind of studies, the measures aren't that um, specific and not that comprehensive. Uh, information here is measured as C-reactive protein levels. And, uh, well, if um, anyone doesn't really know what C-reactive protein is, uh, it's a cute phase protein and quite often used as a me measure of inflammation, although it's not, um, well, that comprehensive. So first of all, we looked at cross-sectional associations. And for these associations, we have about 356 individuals. And the median age was about 58. And the slight majority is females. So in the first step, um, I looked at associations, uh, well, the possible predictors of depression at baseline. And what you can see here is that insomnia symptoms uh, long and long sleep duration are both associated with higher levels of depression score, uh, whereas short sleep duration is associated with lower depression at baseline. And as I mentioned, all the results will always be presented as crude, partly and fully adjusted models. So at, in the next step, we looked at predictors of CRP levels at baseline. And what you can see here is that uh, in the fully adjusted model, frequent insomnia symptoms are not uh, associated with CRP levels. Um, Long sleep duration is in the fully adjusted model um, associated with slightly lower levels of, of C-reactive protein. Um, and that's true for short sleep duration as well. For long sleep, sleep duration in the unadjusted, the, inadjusted, the crude and partly adjusted model, the direction is actually the opposite. So that um, could be something to think of. Um, what we also did was to look specifically at the different types of depression um, and which depressive symptoms that were more specifically associated to, to CRP levels at baseline. Uh, and the, the um, well, part in line with this idea that it's atypical depression rather than, than other types was that uh, frequent tiredness and lethargia was associated with high levels of C-reactive protein and that's 
was also true for uh, frequent and enthusiasm as well as the inter disinterest which were also associated with higher levels of CRP. Uh, funny uh, enough, neither insomnia symptoms or um, frequent depressed mood were associated with higher levels of inflammation. And for long and sleep duration, uh, for long sleep duration, um, in the partly the, the crude and partly adjusted models, long sleep duration were as, was associated with slightly higher levels of CRP, but in the fully adjusted model that association um, changed direction, uh, short sleep duration was associated with lower levels of C-reactive protein in all models. So in the next step, we looked at a potential mediation of inflammation uh, on the association between insomnia symptoms and depressive symptoms in line with the hypothesis that I mentioned before. So here we looked at the, uh, well, how much does the, um, does CRP explain the, uh, the association between insomnia and depression cross-sectionally? And, um, well, mediation is maybe not a fully correct word since it's cross-sectional. Um, so what we can see is that in this model, the indirect effect, um, i.e. The, the mediation, is actually significant. So, uh, but the, the effect is quite small. But uh, there, there seem to be a small um, mediating effect of depression uh, on insomnia and depression via CRP um, if looking at the cross-sectional associations. However, um, later I will show the longitudinal uh, mediation, which might be more interesting. So for longitudinal data, we had about 12,000 individuals at the median age range. At, uh, um, at baseline was about 58. And as you can see, um, we had about 52% females here as well. And this is to look at the longitudinal association between the first and the baseline is and the first follow-up, because as I mentioned, CRP is only measured uh, for the two first visits in the UK Biobank. So first, just to confirm uh, what has been shown repeatedly in other study, we start looking at predictors of depressive symptoms at follow-up. And what you can see here on the first line is that um, frequent insomnia symptoms is a strong predictor of subsequent depression. Long sleep duration is also a uh, predictor of, of uh, subsequent depression, whereas short sleep duration is actually associated with a lower risk of depression. Yes, that's exactly what I showed. So first, frequent insomnia symptoms and uh, the long and short sleep duration. In the second step, we looked at the mediation here as well. And what you can see here is that the indirect effect of uh, insomnia symptoms on depression when looking uh, via CRP in the longitudinal model uh, is not significant. So what we conclude from this study is that uh, insomnia symptoms and depressive symptoms are associated cross-sectionally as well as longitudinally. And um, depressive symptoms, especially tiredness and lack of interest, are associated with inflammation and this is both these things are very much in line with what's previously known. Um, however, neither insomnia symptoms nor sleep durations are associated with higher CRP in fully adjusted models. Um, and inflammation also does not mediate the longitudinal association between disturbed sleep and depression. And with that I'd like to thank all my collaborators as well as the funders and also you for listening. Thank you so much.